Bless the Lord. Thank you. Yeah, sit down if you can. Glory to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right, you guys. Praise the Lord. How many of you went through Samaria this week? I know some of you are going, what? Samaria? You remember last week with the woman at the well? How the Lord has to take you sometimes through Samaria? You know Samaria is not, ge- not a geographical location, right? You know, Samaria is that, whatever it is that you've been trying to avoid all your life, right? Those weak areas, those tough areas, those areas that uh, stress you and challenge you. I, I don't know, maybe you feel like you live in Samaria, you know, but that's probably the truth because God usually takes us through places. We learned three, or I had three observations for you last, year, last week about, um, wh- about following Jesus. What does it really mean to follow Jesus and what can you expect if you really follow Jesus? And the first one was that, that I just mentioned that if you follow Jesus, he's going to take you through areas of your life that you've been trying to avoid. The second thing was he's going to lead you toward things you don't understand. And the third thing is you're going to have to expand your understanding of the vastness of God's love and the fact that God just loves so much bigger and so much stronger than we have ever imagined and that even people that we put outside our love are not outside of his love because he loves us all and he loves us all the same. You know, (laughs) that's the key to it that a lot of times, you know, we just kind of get exclusive and we put limits and we think, man, those people are so evil. But remember, Jesus even loved Samaritans. So that was news to the disciples, by the way, that these young, 12 young men following Jesus on this never-ending Jesus tour, it seems like, and he carried them to the woman at the well in Samaria. Well, today we're gonna, I wanna share with you Three observations, of course, because if it's of God, it's going to be three, right? Every sermon, three points if God gave it to you. Give you three more observations. By the way, there are 11 of these messages, and uh, that means we're going to have about 33 observations. (laughs) A lot of observations before we get finished. But it's really, you know, have you ever wondered why God shared the stories that he does in the Bible? I mean, that out of all the stories and all the things that happened to his people and the disciples and Jesus, I mean, Jesus was here three and a half years, roughly, or a little over three years. I mean, you, you know there were many, many, well, as a matter of fact, the Gospel of John says in the last chapter that if everything Jesus did was written in a book, all of the volumes on earth couldn't hold the things that Jesus did. So that just gives you an idea of what, a, what one of his young men, John, who was probably the youngest disciple, by the way, what he thought about the ministry. And, and, and why is it that these stories are here? Why choose the ones he chose? By the way, the story today is the only one that is in all four Gospels. Uh, many of them are in three Gospels or two Gospels, but this one is in all four Gospels, and it is the feeding of the 5,000. Why did Jesus share the, the miracle of the feeding of 5,000? What's important about that? What does he want us to see? What does he want to say to us through the feeding of 5,000? See, let me just give you a little, a, a, a little uh, pre-thought here. I always thought that the, the feeding miracles, like the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000, which happens, by the way, in the next chapter after Mark 6 and after Matthew 14, it, it, it's reported. And I always thought those feeding miracles were about the people, the people that received them, that they could be fed and they could be full. And, you know, I thought the miracle was about the people. But let me just kind of put a little thought in your head. They're not about, it's not about people that got fed at all. (laughs) It's about those 12 guys standing behind Jesus with that look on their face like, what? (laughs) It's all for them and, and, and it's for us because the Lord knew that all of us would be sitting here and we would be disciples of Jesus. We'd want to follow Jesus. We'd want to know how to follow Jesus, what we were responsible for, how to look at it. And so here he is sharing miracles just like this. We're going to, I'm going to read from Mark 6. Now, I could have read from Matthew or Luke or John, but I think Mark really 
gives us a little more information and it's a little more personal in Mark 6. So let me read Mark 6. Beginning at verse 14, now what, what had been happening for context sake is Jesus had been sending his disciples out to minister and he had been giving them power to overcome demons and to uh, preach and do miracles and all that kind of stuff in these first 13 verses before 14 is where we're going to start. So there was, a, I mean, things were happening. Things were cooking. I mean, they, this was the real ministry going on. And then verse 14 happens. Now, King Herod heard of him. He's talking about Jesus. Now, King Herod heard of Jesus for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it's Elijah. Others said, it's the prophet or one like the prophets. But when Herod heard it, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He was raised from the dead. And Herod's real uh, uh, fearful now because he, he did. All right, let me go on verse 17. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Everybody go, that ain't cool. Uh-oh. Yeah, this is going to be a problem. Because John said to Herod, John the Baptist said to Herod when he heard of it, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I'll give it to you up to half of my kingdom. Man, she must have done some kind of dance, right? I mean, up to half the kingdom? Come on, man. So she went out and she said to her mother, now this is a nice family, you have to understand. So she went out and she said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Nice mother-daughter moment there. Good mentor, right? Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, couldn't be embarrassed and all that, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an, ex an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Mother's Day, wonderful gift. Man, when the disciples heard of it, now get this, I, the, there's a reason I read you this story now. It's what happens right before the feeding of the 5,000. It just feeds right in. I just want you to see what kind of atmosphere we got going on here. When the disciples heard of it, they came and they took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. They, a headless corpse, by the way. Then the apostles gathered to, to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And they told him that his cousin, second cousin, John the Baptist, his forerunner, the son of Elizabeth, the one that baptized him, his great friend and cohort in the ministry, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And many theologians feel that other than the events that surround the crucifixion, that this experience right here was the most personally emotional decision that Jesus, or, or time, that Jesus ever faced on this earth. Now, I know he wept at Lazarus' tomb, but he knew he was gonna raise him in just a moment. But here, John's dead, and Jesus is in great pain, great personal pain, emotional pain, sorrow, grief. So how did Jesus handle pain? Next verse, and he said to them, the disciples that came and shared the news, and he said to them, 
Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Let's take a few days at Gulf Shores, guys. Let's go down to Panama City and just take a few days off. We need to take some days off. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Now this is interesting because I don't know if you've ever thought about how Jesus faced pain. But I always thought Jesus faced pain head on. Just bear through it. I mean, that's what happened around the crucifixion and the cross. I mean, how painful was that? And man, he just, he just faced that head on. He didn't even flinch. As a matter of fact, he called it the joy that was set before him. But yet here he is now with his great friend and forerunner and the death of John the Baptist and, and he withdrew. He stepped back momentarily, just temporarily stepped back away from ministry. Let's go on, verse 33. But the multitude saw them departing and many knew him and ran their own foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. So the crowd who they're trying to get away from get to Gulf Shores before they do. And they're waiting on them when they get off the boat. Verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out of the boat, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion. Everybody say, second wind. Jesus gets his second wind. When he sees the crowd, he's moved with compassion for them because they are like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. So in spite of the great personal pain that he's going through and the fact that he's worn out and the fact that he's in need of recovery and has had such a dramatic loss and such dramatic grief in his life, has such great empathy on that crowd that in spite of all of his need, he ministers to them all day long. Verse 35, when the day was now far spent, almost over, the meeting should be shutting down. I, I know, I don't, well, I say that, I don't know. Let me just ask you, are, have any of you ever been in the ministry? Like at church, in churches or anything like that? Have you ever been in a revival meeting that just wouldn't end? I mean, have you ever been away from home for a week or two weeks or three weeks and you can't go home until that thing ends and it won't end? and you're homesick and lonesome and tired and worn out and spent and give, you've given everything that you possibly can give and you're just sitting there in the last invitation of the last service and you're going, oh God, please. You know, you're going, oh Lord, please. We, got, we need to end this thing right here. And the people just keep on coming down the aisle, getting saved, coming to the Lord, you know, doing. It just won't end. That's what's happening here. And now remember the emotional experience that they've had with John the Baptist. So you know the disciples are, they're frustrated, they're anxious, and, and I know they had to be thinking, if they'll do this to John, will they do it to us? So they're probably fearful, and I mean, just imagine how ragged emotionally they are when, they, when, when this crowd beats them to their, to their vacation spot where Jesus said, let's go and take a few days, and they go, whew, finally, thank you, Jesus, for taking us away so we can rest. We never needed it more. And the, and the people beat them to the spot. <laughs> Heaven forbid. And Jesus gets his second wind. And now, he's been teaching them all day long and it's about dark and surely he's gonna let us go home now. Whew. Verse, 37, uh, verse 36. The disciples say, let me read verse 35. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour's late. Send them away that they may go to, into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, 
Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, you know, they found the little boy with a sack lunch. They said, five and two fish. And one of the other gospel writers says, and what is that among so many? <laughs> then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. That's the only, Mark's the only one that says the grass was green. Others say he sat on the grass, the green grass. I, that seems significant. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fish he divided among them all. And then between verses 41 and 42, this amazing miracle happens. It is amazing. I don't know if you've ever thought of this. Did you, do you see what the scripture says? you see what those verses say? It says what Jesus did is he took the five loaves, broke them into 12 pieces, gave each disciple a piece. He took the two fishes and he broke them into 12 pieces and he gave each disciple a piece of fish. He said, all right, boys, get after it. Jesus didn't break all the bread and break all the fish. He gave it to them to do. Now, can you imagine they're going out in the crowd and they have a little piece of a loaf of bread in their hand and they're just handing a piece to everybody and it just keeps on being there? It never runs out. And the fish never run out. There's 5,000 men there. That means there's as many as uh, at least 10,000 people there, probably 15,000 people. That's a lot of people and a very little bit of fish and bread. This is an amazing, this is, this is like, this is like a wow. <laughs> wow, this is a tremendous miracle. Could you imagine being one of the disciples doing this? You just keep handing and it's like it never goes away. All right, glory to God. Look at what verse 42 says. So they all ate and were filled. What an underwhelming report for such an amazing miracle. Uh, that's all you're going to say? They all ate and were filled? No, no info, no description? Just ho-hum, you know, they all ate and they were filled. Uh, so what? Verse 43, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of the fish. Hey, Johnny, do we have any departing gift for our guests? Yes, we'll give you a basket. Each disciple gets a basket full of fragments that were take-home plates. <sighs> My goodness. Now, those who had eaten and were, uh, had eaten were about 5,000 men, and Matthew 14 adds, besides women and children. Wow, that's a, that's a miracle right there. It's, in, it's recorded in all four Gospels, only one. Only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. So let me give you three more observations <laughs> about what it means from this miracle to follow Jesus. See, all these miracles are there for a reason, and they all have observations in them that are different but they tell us what it means to follow Jesus. So if you're gonna follow Jesus, these are the kind of things that you're gonna get dragged through. Just like this, number one, observation number one, following Jesus requires you to periodically get away so you don't give up. If you're gonna follow Jesus occasionally, you're going to have to withdraw yourself. You're gonna to have to step back. You're going to have to remove yourself periodically or else you're going to find yourself giving up. You're going to quit is what's going to happen. This was not uncommon for Jesus, by the way. Jesus did this a lot. Look in Luke 5. I just put one, uh, verse 15 and 16. However, the report went around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Look at verse 16. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness, deserted place, and prayed, yeah. I mean, I was gonna get to that. Don't you love these administrators? They can't even wait for the punchline. 
you know, t- there's timing in saying things. <laughs> so he himself withdrew into the wilderness, which means the deserted places, and prayed. So one, one of the great lessons that, that I've also learned in, I haven't learned it very well, obviously, in my life, because do, do you guys know that I've never missed a service here in how many years? 13, except one, was it? Two, it was two. Wesley preached one time where we were gone. Now this is 13 years. And Justin preached when I, I think I had my eye, my retina, or you did. I, I had my retina detached and I had to be face down and, I, and it was on a Sunday and I, I couldn't, I, I had to lay face down. So I, obviously I haven't learned it very well is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm preaching about something that I haven't done a lot of. I used to, but I don't anymore. One of the great lessons I've learned in my life is that if you're going to spend your life following him and you're going to make your life about serving other people, if you don't develop a lifestyle of periodically removing yourself, um, you'll eventually give up. And the reason why is because I don't know if you've ever messed with people, but they're all consuming. I mean, they'll just eat you up. It's overwhelming. Jesus was a man's man. We, I mean, think about it. Jesus is a man's man. He's powerful. He's brilliant. He's the son of God. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he had to step back and take a moment. And why did he have to do this? And why would we need to do something like this? Because the goal of our life is not to be a temporary flash in the pan. The goal of our life is to live a life that can be sustained. Not just to arrive somewhere, but to be able to stay there. I learned this lesson in a totally unrelated way back years ago. I used to work out, I told you this last week, I used to work out, for 30 years I worked out. I mean, I worked out hard. I was one of those, you know, people I didn't have any body fat and I was strong and young and all of that. And about 15 years into it, I had an, an epiphany one day on, on, on the squat rack. I had a bunch of, bunch of weight that I was squatting. I had my knees wrapped up. I had a big leather belt with a big wide back to protect my back and my, so I wouldn't you know, get a hernia on the front. And so it was so heavy. And I went down, went up, went down. And I went down again. And when I got about right in here, it dawned on me. It was like, why are you doing this? Are you going to be an Olympic weightlifter? You plan to be a body, I mean, a, a bodybuilder or something? Is that what you're doing? And my answer to myself was, no, I'm just wanting to stay in shape. Then look at yourself. You can have your knees wrapped up so you won't blow a knee out, hopefully, and you got your waist all wrapped up so you won't break your back and throw some, joint, uh, throw some uh, disc out of joint, get hernias and so forth, and then you won't be able to work out at all. Choose you, now this is, choose you something that will challenge you that you can live with that won't kill you and hurt you if you happen to make a mistake. And so for the last 15 years, I chose a regiment that wasn't so heavy, but it still challenged me in some way. And, and that's the, see, that's the point. The point is that we, we're not just trying to live a life where we're like a shooting star. We want to live a life that we can maintain where we are. If you have to give everything you have to get where you are, the chances are you're not going to be able to stay there. Because you gave it all to get there and you can't keep giving it all every moment of every day for the rest of your life. Jesus needed some margin. He needed some space. And so do we. I know that, you know, maybe I'm talking to tough people, I know, and I know you might want to argue about it. Hey, man, you know, I don't want to, you know, you're telling me you know, that I need to rest, I need to step back, I need to take some time off. I don't know if that's necessary. Well, the reason I'm saying this to you is because I believe that I'm talking to somebody right now. And I don't know if they're out there or in here. But somebody right now is about that close to giving it up, pulling the plug, quitting, 
On what? I don't know. But you got to back away sometimes. It's not a loss to back away sometimes to periodically withdraw yourself because your emotions and your anxieties and the pressures and the stresses and the physicalities and everything that you have is challenging you just to give up. And I know most people's answer to not giving up is, well, uh, just don't give up. (laughs) How do you not give up? Well, you, you know, you just don't give up. Well, I'm telling you that even Jesus had to take a step back every now and then in order not to quit. I know in this passage, the people followed him and he got his second win and he ministered to people, but we're gonna look in a future message about what happens after this. And I'm just gonna tell you, he does eventually get his separation and get his rest. And sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just to say no. You can't do everything. You can do some things, but you can't do everything. So you have to plan to remove yourself, even if it's only for a short period of time. All of us are different. It may only take you a short period of time. It may, you may be able to take a drive. If you're a country boy and you're living in the city, drive up there in Socher and Lozana and drive out 53 and just look at the cows on the side of the road and the pastures and all of that. Look at the farmhouses up in there. Go back to yesterday. I do that. That takes me back. I like that. I can get refreshed in a, in, in a drive. Uh, uh, read something, uh, watch some TV, walk, uh, you know, whatever it is that, that you can do that you separate. Get with an old buddy, go fishing, do, I mean, do something that will give you a periodic break so, so that you won't find yourself quitting or even worse. You know what's worse than quitting? Pretending that you're there and then developing some dark escape mechanisms when you should have stepped back. Dark escape mechanisms, uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, sex, gambling, uh, those kind of things, these addictions, these things that eventually take you. You think you have them, but they eventually have you. See, that? you know what? I think that a lot of addictions, a lot of bad, bad things, bad vices, if you want to call them that, that happen in people's lives like that happen far more over the fact that they're trying to medicate themselves in order to escape than it has to do with lust or greed or, or any of that other stuff. But you have to take a step back. You can't quit your job. You can't walk away from that ox you have in the ditch. You can't leave sometimes what it is, it is. And I know some of you probably don't like that statement, but it's, it's absolute truth. Sometimes you just got to grin and bear it. And you can't pull away from them, but you need to choose sometimes, plan sometimes to step back and smell the roses a minute and let, let yourself get refreshed. Well, the story goes on. Uh, they had just lost John the Baptist. They were hurting. They were emotionally wiped out. They were trying to get away for a moment and these people show up at the vacation spot and they want to have a meeting. Are you kidding me? Man, I can just, I can feel those disciples. Are you kidding me? So observation number two. Following Jesus requires that we move past our own personal pain. I don't want to belittle your pain, but everybody listening to this message right now has pain, right? We all have some kind of pain of some kind. Uh, People that hug your neck, shake your hand, smile at you, ask you how things are, you love talking to you. You don't have any idea the personal tragedies or the emotional pain, or the physical pain, maybe their health, maybe their family, maybe their finances, maybe their job. I mean, I'm looking in the faces of people I know. (laughs) You guys have had some terrible stuff. Just terrible stuff. And you smile, you shake hands, you hug necks, even after COVID. I mean, you, you, and nobody even knows that you have all of that stuff. So what did the Father in heaven do for Jesus when Jesus was right in the middle 
of one of the most emotionally draining times of his life. What did God do? God strengthened him right in the middle of the most painful, weak times of his life. When he got in that boat, he said, let's go to Gulf Shores, man. I need a vacation. And then when he, he steps out, the crowd is there, and he says, hey, people, all right, gather over here. I got some stuff to teach you. And he spends all day long teaching the people. God strengthened him right in the middle of the most terrible time in his life. Why am I pointing this out? Because I know people that are waiting right now for things to get better so that they can serve the Lord. Well, when, when, when life gets better, I'll serve. When I get older, I'll serve the Lord. Maybe I need to get a few Bible classes, then I can serve the Lord. Maybe I need to learn about that praise stuff, and then I can praise the Lord. Maybe I need to learn to play an instrument. When I get my voice lessons done, I'll, I'll, I'll do better. I'm just proposing that your pain, now listen, your pain might be the very thing that God uses to touch someone else's life. I mean, the way they will identify with you is, be, is through your pain. It will, it will catch, capture them. It will captivate them. And they will be drawn to you and any possibility of your ministry to them because of the pain in your life. And I, like I said, I'm not trying to belittle it. We, we, we all have pain, and if you wait for your pain to subside, uh, you're never going to go forward. Let me give you a news flash, all right? News flash. God uses pain. Now, I know when you were preparing to come to church this morning, and I probably already lost some of my people watching online because, you know, they can do that. They can just click off when it gets a little bit <laughs> difficult. You guys will have to get up and leave, and we're going to talk about you when you go. But news flash. God uses pain. And I know when you were coming to church this morning, you were probably thinking something like this. My goodness, I hope our wonderful, loving pastor today has one of those good messages for us. And by good message, you mean one of those that, um, that assures me that I'm going to be all right, everything's going to be good, that I'm not as bad as I think I am. <laughs> God's with me, and even though I may be in the valley, God's not going to leave me in the valley. Man, I hope pastor preaches a message like that. And then you tune in or you sit in this church, and here's your, here's your loving, wonderful, loving pastor sitting up here telling you, God's going to give you pain, <laughs> and you better get used to it. <laughs> well, I don't want to get used to it. I want him to take it away. That's what, that's what I want. Well, verse 41, and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up into heaven and he, he blessed and broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples who, to set before the people. And the two fish he divided among them all, so they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Look at this. Look at this. Here's what Jesus expects his 12 human disciples to do just after burying the headless body. How traumatic would that be? You have to go retrieve a headless body of a great friend and ambassador and mentor, fellow minister, and put him in the ground. And then you have to turn right around Without a vacation, without any time off, you got to turn right around and minister to a crowd that had invaded your vacation spot, which you desperately needed. And Jesus expects you to just turn right around with all that pain and just say, Hey, people, come to sit. <laughs> When the day, verse 35, when the day was now far spent, the disciples came to him and he say, they said, this is a deserted place. And already the hour's late. Send them away that they may go to the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they, for they have nothing to eat. The disciples must have been exhausted. They're, they're basically saying to Jesus, let's shut this meeting down. Hey, Jesus, look, we've done a poll out there among all 5,000 men and they're all ready to go home. So we vote, let's shut her down. Can't we do, can't, can't, can't we, can't we do that? 
Hey, great talk, Jesus. Great teaching. Wonderful ministry. Say amen. Let's go, man. Bye. We appreciate the time. Time's up. Verse 37, but he answered. And he said to them, you give them something to eat. Jesus said, we ain't shutting the meeting down. You're going to give them something to eat. It, it's late. They, they need something to eat. And they said, well, here's what they did. I honestly believe that they wanted to tell Jesus no. I really believe that. If you ask me, what do you think the disciples were thinking? I'm thinking they were saying, no, we're not going to feed these people. That's what they wanted to say. But they were smart enough not to say it. They did what we do so many times. They sidestepped the issue. Instead of saying, no, we're worn out, Jesus, give us a break. They said, you know, Lord, we only have 200 denarii, and if we bought all 200 denarii worth of bread, it wouldn't be enough for a big crowd like this. And I'm telling you, Jesus, if we just had enough funds and enough resources, we would certainly do what you just said. I mean, we want to do that so bad, but we just, we're a small church. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. So we really wish we could do it, but, uh, you know, man, if we ever get there, we'll do it for sure, just like you say. That's what they said to him. 200 in there, and he wants to go in town and buy bread. You know what Jesus said? Just give me what you have. He said, what do you have? He says, what do you have? And they went out in the crowd and scrounged around. Jesus said, all right, just give me what you have. Verse 39, then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. Jesus announces to the crowd, everybody, can I have your attention? Everybody, everybody, everybody. We have some food prepared for you and we want you to sit down in fifties and hundreds, all right? We got some food prepared. We're gonna serve it to you. And I can hear the disciples say, no, we don't. Why did he say that? Who gave him those talking points? Peter, did you write that and tell him to say that? Come on, man, we don't even have anything. And then each got a little piece. Now what? Give it to the people. Go ahead. There's 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. You know, like... 300, 400 people. You got 300, 400, three. Go ahead, take it. Hey. And I'm thinking, all right, the ministry's over. Uh, this is the end of the Jesus ministry. The Jesus movement just died right here on this mountain. Because surely somebody's going to film this and it's going to go viral about how foolish we look with this little handful of bread and all these people out here. And it's going viral and then the ministry's going to be over. Mm. And so they ate and we're filled. Ho oh, hum. Um, nothing magical about that, is it? And then classic Jesus. Here comes classic Jesus. He always gives you more than enough. Here he is. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten were 5,000. Jesus says, okay, serve the people. The disciples say, come on, Jesus, we're worn out. We just lost John. We're not in a good frame of mind. And Jesus says, hey, let's go. And one of the most obvious things that we have the tendency to do is the same thing the disciples were trying to do. They were trying to eliminate themselves from service. They were trying to say, Jesus, we're just not capable to do this. We're not mentally aware. We're not, we don't have our emotions in the right place. And you know, Jesus doesn't eliminate us. We eliminate ourselves. And that's what they were trying to do. And, you know, and, and, and do you know what Jesus asked you? You know, you know the only question that he asked you? Have you experienced pain? Have you experienced loss? Are you familiar with sin? Are you familiar with error? Are you familiar with wrong? Okay, you'll do. I can work through somebody like you. Because the fact is, we are all a work in progress. You know, Humpty Dumpty, the nursery rhyme? 
Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, right? We could all say it. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Dumpty together again. I know. It needs that bounce. <laughs> do, you know, do you know that that nursery rhyme probably sold millions of little books all over the world? And you know why it did? Because we are all Humpty Dumpty. We all have had some breaks and a few falls in life. We're all a little cracked in some places. So if you wait until you're the total package in order to do anything, you'll be waiting for your whole life. Our pain, our suffering, our struggles are the connection point with real human beings. And contrary to popular opinion, I started to put this on a slide, but it's not, Dan, so don't try to find it. This is a refrigerator deal. It's pretty long to be one, but just listen to it. Contrary to popular opinion, Christianity was never intended to be a collection of the morally elite and socially acceptable. Christianity was intended to be a hodgepodge group of rejects, rebels, and redeemed that God's grace has washed with forgiveness. That's us. We're all a work in progress. Rebels, rejects, and the redeemed that God has washed with his grace. Observation number three. All right, remember one, you gotta periodically step away. Number two, you gotta push through your pain, your personal pain, and God will strengthen you. Number three, following Jesus requires that you offer what you have right now. Not what you plan to have. Not what you wish you had. Not what you're gonna have one day. But what you have Right now. Let me show you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out of, this verse is going to come out of my, Matthew 14. It's the same as Mark 36, 38 that we've already read, but I like the way Matthew says this. Look at what he says. He says, and they said to him, we have only five loaves and two fish. What is the operative word there? I stressed it, right? You got it. The operative word there is only we only, we only have five loaves and two fish. And what did he say? Bring them here to me. Do you know that nowhere in the scripture do you find the, 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 the concept, much less the phrase, grace for tomorrow? We have hope for tomorrow. We have faith for our future. We have forgiveness for our past. But for today, we only have grace. You don't have grace for tomorrow, you have grace only for today. Matthew six thirty four. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Focus on today. Look at Jesus throughout the scripture. Jesus is a right now God. He's, what do we have? Let's give it to me. Let's see. All you have, just give it to me. Take your only. If you only have five minutes a day, if you only have one evening a week, if you only have Sunday morning in your life, if you only have $10, Take your only and offer it to God. Okay, Lord, here it is. Let me ask you, do you like giving gifts? When you give a gift, do you, are you thinking in the back of your mind, I hope this gift will be well received, or I hope this gift will meet a need. It, you know, any of you give like that? I, all right, do you give to God like that? Is that how you give to God? Thinking that, hey, if I can't give him what he deserves, which is everything, if I can't give him what he deserves, then I'm just not gonna give anything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait till I'm older. I'm gonna wait till I'm more mature. I'm gonna wait till I've got more recesses, resources. And then I'm gonna give him much more then. And God says, no, 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 no. Now, give me what you 
only have. Well, what do you have? Do you have only five loaves and a fish? You may think, that's nothing. Jesus says, give it to me and watch what I can do with it. Do you only have two loaves, one evening, Sunday morning? Give, give them to him and see what he does with it. I think people will be surprised what Jesus can do with what you are thinking, I only, is so small and insignificant. Many think the attitude of Jesus is Jesus thinks that if you can't give him everything, then don't give me anything. But that's not Jesus' attitude. Jesus said, I'll take a minute if that's all you have. I'll take ten dollars, whatever you have, if that's your only, give it to me and, 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 and watch this and look at what I can do with this. I'll take the only that you have, the few that you have, and I'm going to work a miracle out of it that's going to change you forever. Like I said at the beginning, I always thought that this miracle was for the people that received it, the 5,000 that ate and were filled and were astonished at all of this. I thought it was for them. But I have since come to the conclusion it wasn't for them at all. It was for those 12 young men standing behind Jesus going, what? What? Give him your only and watch what he does with it. All right, let's bow.